Hello and welcome to another episode of... It's time to talk about Drake and the Night in Hendrix. Oh my god! Okay, so about every decade or so, there's a piece of media that transcends itself. They transcend the normal critical eye whose only job is to judge something based on its abject quality. Sometimes there's media that transcends reality itself. Drake of the 99 Dragons is one such piece of media. Released in November 2003, Drake went unopposed in the video game industry with not much viable competition. <laughs> I mean, unless you count things like, you know, Grand Theft Auto 3, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, Beyond Good and Evil, Simpsons, Hit and Run, Ratchet and Clank, Going Command, Silent Hill 3, Mario Kart, Double Dash, Final Fantasy X2, Manhunt, Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic, and... Max Payne too. But, you know, aside from that, yeah, it was open season for Drake. In all seriousness, maybe due to this clearly sublime year in gaming, that the sullen-faced, expressionless, black-suited assassin never reached the heights he shouldn't have. But as the old saying goes, I'd rather something be a zero than a five, and Drake of the 99 Dragons is very much a zero. Therefore, to this day, this very cursed game is still talked about in muffled whispers or, or, or like sound proofed keyboards from all across the internet some 17 years later after its infamous debut. It's somewhat of a mysterious artifact within the industry to be sure, but there was never a whole lot known about it or its developer, Idle FX, for years. But information has recently come to light that can hopefully answer all the questions you may have. Things like, what? And, huh? And why? So, let's start off with what we know, the cold hard facts. Idle FX was, heavy emphasis on the was, a Swedish development studio that put out a staggering five games in two years. The first being, um, Gast, which looks like this. Um, let me know in the comments if you've ever played whatever this is. Which was then followed up by the one bright spot in their catalog, the surprisingly solid horror-based first-person shooter Nosferatu The Wrath of Malachi, which uh, actually literally released weeks before Drake did, and uh, that's going to be important later. Now, Majesco is a publisher most of you should know, well, some of you, sh I'm sure a select few are passingly familiar with their name. If you've seen these box arts before, then you've seen Majesco's logo. And if you've seen this box art before, you should know that they love to get involved with huge embarrassing disasters. Good job. Not much dribbling. In fact, Advent Rising might even be intrinsically linked to Drake in a tenuous way. The scope, and by and large, the budget of this sci-fi flop was ever ballooning, so Majesco was quick to greenlight and release a bunch of product to hopefully fund this rising Advent, its forthcoming sequels, and its splendiferous one million dollar cash prize. <laughs> In the two years leading to its release, Majesco published some 39 titles, with Drake just being one of them. Now, before we dive in or spastically leap forward while waving our arms all around, did you know that Idle FX also had another game they developed and had released that same year, making it three in total? Yes, this was the well-known, nostalgia-inducing platforming gem that has been exhaustively covered on such channels as Anti and some call me Johnny. Blue Paul, Straka Mi O Gred Schuver. Ooh, that, uh. I was nervous about that. Yeah, if you're already a small developer and you somehow still squirt out three games in one single year, it's probably safe to assume at least one of them got the short end of the programming stick guess which one that was. Now, there's some unverified reports that Drake of the 99 Dragons had a development time of six months as per their contract with Majesco, which would explain a lot. 
At the same time, though, if you think about it, this doesn't really make sense at all, because it's poorly designed, optimized, tested, and everything Drake is, six months still seems awfully short to put a full third-person shooter together in 2003 on two different SKUs. This is where one Andrew Bado comes in. A plucky tester who worked at Majesco's New Jersey office, he has, in the subsequent years, opened up about his time working at the company, which includes having to test Drake of the 99 Dragons. Like, for for a job for, for like four months straight. In an interview with Bad Game Hall of Fame, he disputes, dispels, and confirms the legends that have surrounded Drake for years, including that infamous six-month dev time. Having spent seven years as a QA tester myself, a lot of his account rings true with my own experiences. The information about the game being made in six months is false. I started at Majesco in June 2003, five months before the game's release and it was already in beta, so I'd estimate the total dev time to be around 18 months. It seems like there might have been a language barrier, however, between the Swedish Idol FX dev team and the Majesco QA in New Jersey, because no matter how many times we submit a bug report, nothing ever got fixed. This actually jives with the timeline of the game's marketing as well, because in March of 2003, Majesco began showing a game simply called Drake, which looked about the same as the final product did. If we then apply simple math, that's one, three, six, that's seven months in between when the game was first shown to media outlets versus when it was on store shelves. Now, in terms of the bug vetting process, only the most serious and obvious issues that the testing team ran into got any attention from Idle FX, as it's safe to assume that the resources were stretched thin, since, you know, they were working on three different games at the same time and all. Knowing that, you can imagine that suggestion bugs or D-class issues, basically a QA tester finding that a particular aspect of the game could improve, were incredibly ignored. A lot of attention was directed towards suggesting simple solutions to improve level design and signposting and possible ways to balance the game a bit. But the further along we went, the fewer suggestions there were, as we knew they would most likely be rejected or ignored. In the end, we had to focus on Drake's more glaring technical issues and abandon any hope of improving aesthetics and balancing. So it's at this time when you must be thinking, why is this happening? Who's keeping this going? Why is Drake even being made? Well, for some reason, good old memorable Drake was actually being positioned to have a media empire built around him. Him. This guy. This, this is a character uh, built to last. So this is how it really feels to be undead. The intent was that when Drake came out and knocked the collective socks off the entire gaming industry, a comic book would then be launched, a toy line, and possibly even a cartoon following that. While it's unknown exactly where this rather insane notion came from, who chose him? You did. It's simple to imagine that since Drake leaned heavily on Max Payne as an influence, Swedish Idol FX thought they could duplicate neighboring Finnish developer Remedy's success, which, if you look at them side by side, is pretty overt. Andrew Bado confirmed that this enthusiasm for spinning Drake off into different mediums was something that a Majesco producer was pushing, and pushing hard, talking about how once it came out, Drake would be the next big thing. Throughout his misadventures working on it, Andrew also came to realize that Idol FX were incredibly protective and proud of their new blockbuster franchise in the making, which might have, no, definitely contributed to their stubbornness to listen to suggestions. Now, gameplay and bug testing aside, how could a property that has cutscenes like this Nothing can stop me now! ever hope to translate to comics or cartoons. Well, just as the programming design or animation was maligned, so too was Drake's narrative and voice acting, which, according to Andrew Bado, were never really improved not much at all. As far as I remember, the cutscenes were there from the very start, even before the levels all connected, so we in QA assumed they were placeholders. Then came the day when we were supposed to get all final cutscenes. We gathered around our lead's machine, waiting to see how they looked, and they were all the same, but 
of nicer compression quality. It's starting to become increasingly clear that despite them working on multiple projects and there being lots of potential merchandising money on the table, Idol FX were increasingly ignorant of Drake's lack of quality and general polish. There seemed to be this perplexing, overwhelming sense of positivity about the game's chances when it hit the market. This is very much an Emperor's New Clothes style scenario, because one quick look at the credits of Drake reveals something very interesting. The game was mostly the brainchild of one person. Oh lord, I gotta say this guy's name. Stefan Junkvist is listed as the game's co-director and a main designer, but not only that, he worked on it as an artist as well. And not only even more than that was the game's sole writer. Yeah, while there certainly was a full team that worked on the game, Stefan here could be considered the Tommy Wiseau of Drake of the 99 Dragons. So, when you are focused on creating your work of art and not slapping together some Mickey Mouse shit, you might forget to implement certain basic tenets of game design. One of said things is a basic checkpoint system, because in Drake, there is none. You have one shot to complete each level within a certain time limit, but fortunately, most levels can be completed in only a couple of minutes, but less fortunately, some latter levels are a lot longer. If you die for any reason, and believe me, there's lots of reasons, you'll need to start all the way back at the beginning of said mission. That might be okay for a game in the 8 or 16-bit era, but remember, this is 2003. There's also a variety of gameplay features and moves the player can perform in Drake that they will most likely never perform in Drake. Much like in certain FPSs, there is an overpowered state that Drake can achieve, if he gets more health than the maximum limit. When he achieves this, he can then perform the game's most powerful move, Unleash the Dragon, which decimates all enemies on screen as well as makes short work of most bosses. However, getting in any situation where you have an overflow of health is nigh impossible in Drake, as there is a constant barrage of small arms fire coming from all angles. This is another example of Idol FX not bothering with any sort of balancing whatsoever. These features were implemented, yes, but not tuned correctly to benefit the player at regular intervals. This same mistake also makes the final boss of the game, a three-headed cel-shaded monstrosity, incredibly hard to overcome. Wonky hitboxes, being able to almost one-shot Drake with little warning, and also being incredibly drawn out, make this entire encounter, to put it lightly, 100% pure <laughs> It makes you question why you even came this far in the first place. A ludicrous, unbalanced final boss must be one of the clearest indicators of either a rushed production schedule, simple ignorance, or in this case, a combination of both. The back of the box touts 25 exciting missions, but as I'm sure most people won't know because they most likely never saw beyond the first couple of levels, is that Drake and his 99 Dragons is incredibly brief, clocking in at around the 3 hour mark. There is also absolutely no incentive for the player to ever pick up the controller again, as there's no boss rush, multiplayer mode, challenge mode, cheat skins, or even a hentai CG shrine gallery to unlock once the game is over. Now, with all this knowledge in our brains, when Drake's slovenly slow-mo jumped onto store shelves, it received reviews on the lower end of the scale. It was dragged through the mud. It was pegged as the worst game of the year and possibly of the generation. Nothing can stop me now. Shut up. We stopped you. Then GameSpot's Alex Navarro, for example, claimed it was the second worst game of that year lagging just behind Big Rig's Over the Road Racing, which, to be fair, is absolutely fair. Many other outlets shared similar sentiments, and coupled with that glut of amazing titles released in 2003, helped highlight the literal thousands of shortcomings that Drake had. This then combined with paltry sales numbers that, you know, are unknown to the general public unless you count VG Charts' numbers, which, of course, I don't. Majesco's big gamble certainly did not spin off into comics, toys, or anything, really. It got a PC version the following March, which is, to its credit, greatly improved over the Xbox original. There were plans to port the game to the PS2, but that was cancelled because... I 
I mean, of course it was. Idol FX were either closed down or absorbed into another Swedish company shortly after their next and last release, FBI Hostage Rescue. Follow me, follow me. Follow me. Majesco lived on after Drake and Advent Rising, surprisingly, all the way until 2016, where they finally announced they had ceased all video game publishing. Until the following year, where they seemingly started back up again. They have since settled into a nice pattern of refusing to re-release Double Dragon Neon on modern systems. Please politely at them on Twitter about that. As for Drake and his 99 Dragons, well in 2018, suddenly, for no discernible reason, it got an updated re-release on Steam that, like outlined before, is far more polished than the Xbox original. And it's like $7 if you are are morbidly curious. Andrew Bado, for his part, went on to games of his own, being a lead on the recently released Mystic Bell, a charming platformer which was published by WayForward a few years ago, proving that at least someone walked away from those 99 dragons unscathed. Therefore, it's only fitting that it's with the words of Andrew, the guy in the trenches, that we'll leave on. Drake of the 99 Dragons was a spectacular train wreck from start to finish. We kept on waiting for that magic moment when everything starts coming together, but it never arrived. Meanwhile, the Idol FX guys were confident in their product, as appeared to be the marketing. I remember wondering, could it be that perhaps I was wrong and the game was actually okay? Maybe I was just too close to it, too familiar with its flaws to see it for the masterpiece it was. Nope, Drake was trash all along. So thus closes this chapter on all our lives, this chapter of learning what the shit damn happened to this ungodly, unfinished abomination of absurdity. If you know of any other forms of media, video game, or movie that should be hoisted onto our stage, let me know in the comments below or leap in shooting guns akimbo at the Flophouse VIP Patreon to paint a target on your own personal nomination. See you next time and thanks for watching.